And that is the second button. We are now streaming. We are now recording. By all accounts, everything looks good, I think. Yeah, seems like we're good. Okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. Hi and welcome. I got to press the button, don't I? Over here, that button. Hi, everybody. Hello and welcome. Thanks for being here. Tonight is a really big night. Tonight's going to be one for the keeper. It's going to be one to definitely put a gold star by because tonight, over the course of 90 minutes to two hours or so, I think, I'm going to explain to you one of the most fundamental things I know. And I am somebody prone to a little hyperbole. I am prone to hyping some shit up and talking about things in some big ways. But I want you to understand that the thing I'm about to explain to you, the thing I'm about to say, it's not hyperbole. If you understand the thing I'm going to talk about tonight, when you get good at it, when you get familiar with it, when you get comfortable with it, when you start making it your own, please understand that this is going to change the way you write significantly and for the better. This is a big damn deal. And I want you to understand just how big that is because this is one of the few statements I've ever heard at a job that has radically positively impacted my day. It has made my life different and better. And somehow, of course, somehow now, it booted me offline. You son of a bitch. All right, hang on a minute. Let's try cutting the music. Let's see, let's see if that makes a difference. Maybe I'm pulling too many things. This is particularly frustrating because I got all this stuff together. And it is working in theory just fine. There we go. Why is it being so finicky? All right. Anyway, that's going to bug me, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Anyway, I apologize for the inconsistent f- stuff. It's just the way everything is set up. I literally don't have the equipment to make this signal any better. I'm doing the best I can. I appreciate your patience. What I have for you tonight, this piece of advice, is absolutely a game changer. And I... I I don't want to undersell it, but at the same time, I'm afraid of overselling it. So maybe we should just start and whatever happens, happens. How's that sound? Sounds pretty good to me. So we start tonight with a story. In 1997, I was a young, pretty stupid kid who was just getting started as a copy editor. I had worked in submissions, I had worked in some marketing, but I was really eager to get up whatever ladder really made sense to go up in terms of this job and in terms of this field. And I was at the same time going to school during the day and also I had picked up a part-time job in the evenings working in a different medium, working in radio. So my day was busy. These were 16, 18 hour days. And you're young, you're 19, 20, 21, 22. You're fine. You can get by on three, four hours sleep consistently. You can work yourself, you know, well past healthful levels. You can work yourself well past any kind of normal good structure because you're, you're trying to make a name for yourself. You, you are hustling your way up and down whatever moves you have to make. And I was dissatisfied with my position. I have always been somebody who's been pretty impatient, pretty eager for more knowledge, more success, more this, more that, more attention, more whatever. And I was more so then than now. I've gotten, I've mellowed in my old age. But especially back then, I was really like, insistent on being accepted and I was really eager to 
know things, to be in the know, to be special, to be somebody who would command attention. And I was at a, a place in my life and a time in my life where I was just starting to get that. I was never, you know, hyper athletic or, or hyper, you know, super financial successful, but I was funny and I was clever and I was a hard worker. And I just often lucked into situations where there was, you know, the right sort of circumstances where I could get a job or I could make some people laugh or I could get some work done or I could make some money or I could get some booze or I could get some pills or I could get laid or I could go to a party. I was always just sort of around on the edges of stuff and I was really impatient for more, more of everything. I am at heart an addict. So I was doing this copy editing and it was really fairly boring. It was really boring. If you think I'm bored by copy and proof work now, imagine me at 20 knowing that what I was doing and, you know, I could have been looking at people's butts and boobs or something, or I could have been at a bar or I could have been eating something or I could have been playing a video game. But instead I'm sitting here in somebody else's apartment with a clipboard and a pen making and figuring out where the commas and the periods go and the semicolons and the quotation marks. And it's, it's starting to wear on me. And the guy who was, I was apprenticed to, the guy who was teaching me how to do this job that I have been doing since really was at times far more patient than I think he should have been. Because if the roles were reversed, if I were now him talking to a younger me, I would have been fed up with me because I remember being somewhat of a jerk. The, the point I'm making here is that while I'm doing this copy work, learning the basics of the job, I am grumbling loudly. And nine times out of 10, I kept my mouth shut. And of course, it's flagging again. Why? Why? There's literally nothing going on. I don't have any browsers open. I don't have any this or that open. It's, it's pretty much free and clear. This is really irritating. I swear it's got to be the signal strength across the house. I'm just two extra inches away from whatever outlet or cord or receiver I need to be. That's super irritating. Anyway, coming back. So I'm chomping at the bit here. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going nuts. I'm going crazy trying to get this stuff done. And he's being super patient. His name is Sid. I'm gonna, you're going to hear me use that name quite a few times. And, and he, he's dead, so I don't feel bad talking shit about him. But he, he was patient with me to some degree. We, we made this stuff work. And I remember getting angry at him and saying, I didn't want to copy it anymore. Give me something else. Give me something to do. Tell me, tell me what the hell the point of this job is because I sure as hell don't see that everybody who does this, and I didn't see him just doing commas and semicolons and M dashes. I, you know... I'm so sorry there are that many ads. I, I, I'm very sorry. I appreciate you stomaching the ads, and I promise you I'm going to make a difference. I'm gonna, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off. It's, I swear. Thanks for being here, by the way. I really appreciate it. Anyway, so I ask him, hey, man, can I, can I get more than this? Because what, hi, everybody. What I have here is, is this sucks. I want more. And he would look at me dead in the face dead in the face and go, you are not ready for more. And I would tell him repeatedly, oh, I'm, I'm very ready. I, I am ready for more. Well, I don't know what this is, but I'd like, give me something. And we're going back and forth and back and forth. I'm getting the work done, but I'm very dissatisfied. And over time, this turns into, hey, if you don't give me something new, I'm leaving. I'm walking. I don't care how much potential you see. I don't care about the benefits of this. If you don't give me something other than copywriting work to do or copy editing work to do, I'm gone. So he looks at me one day, puts his sandwich down. He looks me dead in the face and goes, okay, here's a thing you're not ready for, but whatever. Every sentence is a camera. And then, then he just walked away. Thank you for supporting him with a sub. That's really wonderful. Then Sid walks away. And... Absolutely positively, my brain gets locked on this idea. What do you mean every sentence is a camera? What the hell does that mean? What's, what, what the shit is this? 
And he's like, well, just go back to work. Now you, now you know something. Now you know a big, deep magic trick. Now you're you, fine. Go back to your work. You learn something new. Keep going. And the entire time, I'm, I'm stewing on this because I'm, I'm one of those people, even now, take an idea, grab onto it, shake it around, see what works. And the entire time I'm doing the copy editing, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It absolutely positively gets stuck in my head. Because anytime I ask him a question, he's like, well, you're not ready for the answer. Just every sentence is a camera. Well, what about this? Every sentence is a camera over and over and over for a couple months. Now, I want to tell you there's a scene in The Karate Kid that if I had the ability to stream it without getting a strike of some kind, I'd stream it. It's this particular scene in the first Karate Kid movie where Ralph Macchio has come to Mr. Miyagi and said, hey, oh my God, you're giving away subs. You are amazing. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Wow. I don't think I've ever really had that happen. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So... There's this scene in The Karate Kid where, where Ralph Macchio, where Daniel, is, is desperate, desperate to try and learn karate. And he goes over to Mr. Miyagi, and Miyagi starts giving him, like, household chores. Paint the wall, paint the fence, paint the house, sand the deck, wax on, wax off. You, you know that stuff, right? Oh, my God, you guys are amazing. So we're, we're going through all this, and we're doing all this, and and... You know, he, you know, every time Daniel asks for karate, Miyagi's like, hey, you got these chores to do. You're doing great on these chores. You're doing great on these chores. And one day there's this moment where, where Daniel gets really upset. And he's like, look, man, I'm not here to do your chores. I came to learn karate. Are you going to teach me or not? Oh, my God, you're incredible. You guys are fantastic. So there's this moment where Miyagi turns to him and goes, okay, show me, show me the chores. Show me the moves you did with the chores. So, you know, they show him like wax on, wax off, paint the fence, paint, you know, do this, lift that, lift that. And all of a sudden Miyagi starts throwing punches. And Daniel has this light bulb moment where, holy shit, all those things that I thought were boring ass chores was secretly karate this whole time. I love that moment. I'm, I, I love that movie. There's a reason why it makes its way into nearly every stream and every recording. I think it's a great set of examples for lots of different reasons. So I'm having this moment where he's given me this sort of, you know, where Sid's given me this every sentence is a camera piece of bullshit, and I don't know what the hell to do with it. But he keeps handing me, like, more and more copy editing, more and more stuff. And I'm not seeing how we get from copy editing to every sentence as a camera until one day I go over there to work expecting to finish a lady's manuscript, expecting to finish like 10, 15 pages of copy editing and then have to read some books. And instead, I am presented in his living room with the following setup. So there's him on his couch. And there is a chair and he's watching the television. So he's facing forward watching the TV. And there's a chair sort of facing the couch where if you sit in the chair, you back, your back will be to the TV. And he tells me to sit down and he hands me some lunch and he explains, today, you're going to do something different than copy editing. And I'm ecstatic. I think this is the fucking best. I've made it. Here we go. And he explains to me that, that we're going to play a game. And we're going to talk about this game a little later on. But we're going to play a game and it's going to change everything. Because now, all of a sudden... It's time. And it was time to learn that every sentence is a camera. So the game in a in a nutshell is now this is remember the late 90s, early 2000s. So we're not dealing with like streaming video or anything. We're dealing with like VHS tapes and laser discs. So the game plays like this. I would sit in I would sit on his very fancy leather couch. He would sit with his back to the television. Uh, there would be a scene paused on the television screen. I would have to first verbalize and then maybe mime it out, maybe move around the space, and then ultimately write down some version of what I saw on the screen so that he, sitting with his back to the TV, could read what I said or hear what I'm saying or watch my mime and understand what was on the screen without turning around and looking at the TV. He called that the visual game. And I thought this was one, thank God I was done with copy editing, but mostly I thought it was just amazing because we watched some dumb shit. 
We watched some soap operas. We watched a couple movies. We watched the news. And I had to relay, you know, closed captioning for the dialogue and and gestures and everything. I had to relay to somebody who could not see the screen what was on the screen without, you know, well, the news guy is now saying this. And, and you know, then he says this and that. I had to put the picture in Sid's head. I had to play the game. And then once I did it, whether or not he got it or not, we'd have a good laugh. Mostly he'd laugh at me, and then we'd switch places. And he would talk me through a scene, and he would mime through a scene, and he would write like you know two, three paragraphs about a scene, and I'd be blown the hell away. Because while it wouldn't be 100% accurate, he wouldn't get like every inch of every little thing, right? He'd get enough of it that I could see something in my head. And we go back and forth and do this game maybe twice a week. I was there every day, maybe two, three times a week we'd play this game and then we'd go do other stuff. And he's like, this is every sentence is a camera. This is exactly what it means. And I'm like, oh, okay. But over time, it clicked. What every sentence, every sentence is a camera describes the functions of sentences and it describes the responsibility you have as a writer to your audience. Your job is to put a movie in the reader's head, period, period. Your job is to put a movie in the reader's head, not still images, not stick figures, not impressionistic weird ass paintings, straight up movie, whether you want to film that in 8K, IMAX with, you know, 12.1 sound, however you want to describe your super ideal movie, your job is to put that movie, video and audio, into somebody else's brain when they can't see the screen. You have to sit there and detail it to them. Every sentence is a camera. So tonight, my goal is to teach you to show you how to do this. I've got some notes. If you're going to watch me, because now I'm on camera now. Hi. I've got notes. I actually have notes. I wrote this down. No more winging it on this one, because this one's serious. So, we're going to start tonight. And yeah, I killed the music, because I think the music is part of what's contributing to my bandwidth issues. Who knows? But we're going to start tonight by talking about the first two and really the biggest two functions of a sentence. And I want to say this for the people in chat watching this right now. If you have any questions at any time, I need you to ask them just whenever it's totally fine. You're not going to mess it up. I don't care if you think the question's stupid, ask whatever question you want, whenever cool, cool. And if you're listening to this on the podcast feed or you're checking this out on YouTube later and you have questions, if you're on YouTube, leave the questions in the comments down below. And if you are listening on the podcast, find me on social media or leave a, leave a comment wherever you get your podcasts from. And I will somehow get them. I'm not sure how that works, but somehow wherever you leave comments, I see them. Weird. Anyway, the functions of a sentence. There are two. I got to remember that you're here now, not here. There are two functions of a sentence, right? And that's it. I mean, there's, there's other ones that are ancillary. We'll cover those on other weeks. But we got two big ones. And if you understand these two big ones, you'll, you'll a lot of the arguing on the internet goes away. A lot of the dumb shit on the internet goes away. Two functions of a sentence. Function number one. A sentence's job is to introduce the reader of that sentence to new information they didn't already have. Something. New information. You're talking about stuff that's in existence. What's the podcast called? That's a fantastic question. It's John Helps You Tell Your Story. It should be available literally where all your podcasts are available. If you use the command in chat, podcast, it should give you the link. In theory, I think it's that, that link. So, first function of a sentence is to bring you and inform you about new information. 
any information, whether that's objects or descriptions or weather or time or space or character or action. It's just information you didn't know before you read that sentence. And it doesn't matter if it's dialogue. It doesn't matter if it's exposition. It doesn't matter if it's flashback. It doesn't matter what tense it is. It just any sentence brings information that you didn't know. That's function number one. Function number two. How did I phrase it in my notes? The other function of a sentence, if it's not introducing new information, it's providing detail to help you expand on existing information. So every sentence is either telling you something you didn't know or communicating to you new information about stuff you did know. And if you look at those two actions, you look at those two functions, what you're going to find is that we've immediately obliterated the show versus tell horseshit argument. Because instead of having show and tell be diametrically opposed, instead of having them be two things where you're supposed to run like hell from one and embrace the other, no, that's not how this works. They are two tools that serve the same job in two different ways. It's not show versus tell. It's show and tell. If you want a tool analogy, it's the slotted and Phillips head screwdrivers in your toolbox. They're both screwdrivers. They both do something with screws, but they each work with a different kind of screw. Show and tell are not enemies. Show and tell are just ways of expressing or broadcasting information from you to the reader. Sometimes when you, you know, have a sentence that brings new information, that tells the reader something they didn't know, you're telling them. Oh my God, it's telling. Now, if you follow the advice on the internet, holy shit, you've committed some kind of great atrocity. But it's information they didn't know. If I tell you that there is a, a black cat nestled in the folds of my gray hoodie, I'm telling you that there's a cat, that there's a hoodie, that they're roughly on the side of the chair over there, that the cat is nestled. I'm telling you these things. You didn't know them before. I'm telling you. But if I give more details and talk about the folds of the fabric or the color of the cat or the size of the cat or how loud the cat is purring at the present moment, I'm going to show you those details because I'm expanding on existing information, but I'm also telling you because it's new information. Sentences can perform both functions and show and tell all at the same time because the goal of writing, whatever the hell it is you're writing, is not to have some kind of magic quantity of show and some kind of magic correct quantity of tell. The whole point is plain and simple to put a movie in the reader's head. And in order to film a movie, you need cameras. And every sentence is a camera. But that is just the first step in this. But we need to blow show and tell out of the water because I'm going to use show and tell as verbs when I describe things. So I don't want you to get bogged down and go, well, he's talking about telling. No, I'm using verbs. I'm using the language. Don't get hung up on what I'm showing and what I'm telling. Just know that I'm trying to put a movie in the reader's head. Every sentence. Every time. So back to this game we're playing. We're doing our best. We are loosely keeping score in the sense that whoever wins doesn't have to go pick up lunch for the two of us or doesn't have to do like, you know, take out the trash when we're done or doesn't have to like hail a cab to take us somewhere in New York City. There's always a, a, a win-loss record and a prize. It doesn't really matter. I'm losing the majority of these things because I'm new at the game. I'm enjoying this. This is way better than copy editing. But I'm starting to see how to manipulate language. And over time, we expand the game. Because instead of looking at still paused frozen images on a screen, now we're watching stuff together. Now we're watching the news. Now we're watching weird soap operas. Now we're watching movies. And we're talking 
over them, not like in a in a in a mystery science theater three thousand riff tracks kind of way, but in like sort of what I do with the Patreon. If you're familiar with the Patreon feed, where as a movie is playing, I'm sitting there saying like, okay, well here's a character arc, and this is the way this is shaped, and hang on a minute, here's a problem, and what about this, and what about that. I'm I'm walking through the story as the story's playing out, and I started to see that the construction of a story and how it's shaped translates onto the screen. Okay, so this would be a paragraph. This would be a sentence. This would be a whole scene made of this many sentences and this many paragraphs. This is a chapter. How do I know it's a chapter? Because of this and that. And he would start asking me not necessarily incredibly deep questions. Like those would come way later. But for now, just getting started, it was a matter of who's the protagonist? What's, the, what's that guy's goal in this scene? Why is he doing that? Why is it easy or hard for him? Now, I'm in my early 20s. Whenever I'm not doing this job, I'm basically trying to get drunk or laid. I'm not thinking about things in this way other than for these few hours I'm with this old weird dude. So to have these conversations come up, and then very quickly get, you know, switched for, hey, what do you want? Do you want it? you want Chinese? We should get some Chinese food. Let's, let's order Chinese. Get the menu. Get something. But to think about stories in this way changed for me how to look at every story. Because now when I watch something, yeah, I'll watch it and enjoy it, but I'll also be able to watch it and enjoy it and say, okay, that's the protagonist, that's the antagonist, that's a you know a two-part arc, a three-part arc, this has got this step and that step. I can look at its guts. I can look at its components because every sentence is a camera. And likewise, every camera shot can be a sentence. It does work the other way. i got to remember to gesture up here. The other way around, but we'll get there later tonight. But for now, that's the game. That's the basics. If you want to play this game now, not right this second, we're talking to each other. But if you want to go play this game, here's the modern version. I took this, you know, once Sid died, I, I, I took his shit and I've, I've made it my own. Here's your version. I want you to find something on your phone, find something on YouTube, find something streaming. Find your favorite scene. Find any scene, but your favorite works the best because you know it well. Pause it. Have somebody you're, I don't know, somebody you're married to, somebody you're dating, somebody you're living with, your kids, uh, your best friend, somebody in a Discord who can't see the screen, somebody in Facebook, somebody you're messaging, whatever. Try to explain to them what it is you're seeing but don't get bogged down in the proper nouns of things. Yeah, it might be tempting to use character names, but pretend for a second that they don't know everything to the depth you know. So sometimes you're going to have to use character names and sometimes you're going to have to use pronouns. Or sometimes you're going to have to use descriptions of characters instead of proper nouns or pronouns. Because the idea is, for the person who can't see the thing you're viewing, you want to give them as much detail as possible so that they can imagine it in their brain and then you can confirm and go, this is what I was talking about. Does it match the thing on the screen? That's the game. Mastering that, first of all, it's a lot of fun when you're sober. It's still fun when you're drunk, especially if you want to add in the other layers of like, you have to mime out what the characters are doing. That's pretty great. And then you have to, you know, write it down in text. It's a little crunchy. But that's sort of the next level. That's kind of like, how do we step it up a notch? Well, now instead of describing it verbally, now we're going to write it. But to do that, you have to understand the limitations of a sentence. We already talked about the functions, but now we got to talk about the limitations. The major limitation of a sentence is that a sentence can only contain a certain amount of information, and that is going to be dependent on two factors. One, the construction, the way you organize the words. And two, how you punctuate it. And I don't just mean put a period at the end or put a question mark at the end or whatever. I'm talking about commas and dashes and semicolons and a host of other factors. But mostly it's going to be sentence construction, the wor what words in what order, and how we interrupt it or make it move or flow or bend or stop or start with punctuation. 
those tools will absolutely shape a sentence. We can create run-on sentences that way by just always using commas and ands. We can create little short fragments by eliminating whole sections of grammar. We can create very simplistic sentences with, you know, see Dick run, run Jane run, very simple sentences. You can do a lot of things with punctuation and word choice. And when it comes time to think about what you want the reader to picture in your in their brain, you need to be able to have a clear sense of what's in your brain so that you can relay it to them. Which means you can't fit as many things as you think in one sentence. There's always room for more than one sentence. Just make another sentence. It's, it's okay to do that. Because it's not about... How many sentences do you have? It's about, on some level, your word count. But, but if you're drafting, who gives a shit about word count? Just get the story out. Because then you can always go back and revise and polish and tweak and reshape it. Just get the story out. And your job remains to put a movie in the reader's head. And the reader does not have any information if you don't get it across to them. How are they supposed to know whatever it is you're trying to tell them if you don't mention it? If you say, oh, well, there's a a chair in the living room, you might mean a wooden rocking chair like your grandma had in your grandma's house. But if you just say, a chair, who knows what the hell they'll picture? Maybe they'll picture an office chair. Maybe they picture a dining room table chair. Maybe they picture a recliner. Sometimes that's going to be okay because you don't really give a shit that they, you know, care so much about the specifics of this chair. But maybe you need it to be important because you're going to be talking about it for another couple sentences. Or maybe it's important to you because you're trying to say, this scene is important, so these details matter. Keep them in your brain. And you need to do a better job of being specific. Writing is the act of making decisions. So if you're trying to figure out how to get the information across, it starts with making decisions in terms of, well, I'm deciding what to say and what not to say. And since you can always make more sentences, since you can always punctuate and construct them in any number of ways, there are loads of ways to get across this information. There is not one perfect way that absolutely solves everything and you've got to like, play Wordle, essentially, to try and guess it in a certain number of tries, you can take all the tries you want. You can you can do whatever it is you want. You just have to keep producing words on the page to put the movie in somebody's brain. Everybody with me so far? Because from here on out, we're going to cover the how. I know it's a little weird to do it without music, but I swear to you my reception's better without me doing the extra streaming. I'm pretty pleased about this. Cool. Here we go. So over the course of this, there are going to be other terms. Yeah, I know that every sentence as a camera is itself a term, but it's also pretty straightforward. But there are writing narrative design terms that you need to know. And when they come up, I'm going to stop everything and explain it to you. So if you miss a term, just holler and it'll be fine. Okay. So the first two functions of a sentence to create information and expand on existing information are going to cover a multitude of everything. If that information is not spoken by a character in the world, I don't care whether that's a protagonist, an antagonist, a sidekick, the random person who bags groceries, the mailman, who knows what. If it's not dialogue, then that text, that sentence, that information is delivered in exposition. Exposition comes in two flavors. Exposition and narration. What's the difference? Exposition is just detailed sentences. Stuff, you know, sentences with stuff in it. Narration 
is exposition delivered by a narrating character. It is somebody telling the reader the story. In first person, that's where you use I, your narrating character is your point of view character. In third person, let's say third person omniscient, your narrator is essentially like the puppeteer. It's the guy floating way above the whole scene, giving you the big broad view. It's also implied because unlike an I narrator, there's not really a casual relationship there. And with third person limited, that that puppeteer relationship exists, but it's much closer to the characters because it's limited. We're not literally free to go everywhere. We're kind of constrained. So your narration follows your point of view character and your exposition helps create detail in the world. And if it's not narration and not exposition, it's probably dialogue. Are there other things? Yes. Are they ever really going to come up for you? Not really. And dialogue is just two characters talking. Or more than two characters talking. It's just characters making mouth sounds. We, sit, we cover those things because all three of those, narration, exposition, and dialogue, have their own set of internal how-to-do-it, how-to-do-it rules that you need to know. And they all fit in and dovetail with the idea of every sentence is a camera. It's just that the issue, the question, the thing, the idea is what is it a camera of and what is it showing us? What is it broadcasting? What is it putting in the reader's mental movie screen? So let's start with dialogue. Dialogue is reactive. Dialogue is what a character says in response to some kind of stimuli. Something happens in the world Something happens and they feel something. Something happens and the character is made aware of it or is aware of it to some way, shape, or form, and they say something as part of their reaction and response to it. So, for instance, car blows up. Holy shit, look, the car blew up. Character A yells at character B, ah, well, you're a piece of shit. Character B turns around and goes, well, no, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. Dialogue is reactive. The camera is showing us not only the words the, char the character is saying, but it's also speaking to how the character feels. Because if two characters are talking and having a fairly okay conversation about, I don't know, uh, colors to paint a room, I'm just picking very benign things, you're probably not going to have one character blow up at somebody else over something totally unrelated if we're busy, you know, two characters are talking about, well, what shade of green should this be? Two people talking about green, one of them is not going to go, well, yeah, and, you know, I've always hated your sister. Where, where's that coming from? Dialogue is reactive and situational. So it's either referring to the current situation that it's in or it is referring to a situation that has existed previously that for some related to the present moment reason the character is reacting to. What does that mean in English? You know how something can happen to you at like 10 o'clock in the morning and you're real pissed and you just sort of let it simmer all day? and you're getting angry about it, and then all of a sudden somebody makes some offhand comment at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you blow the hell up at them, and it seems like their comment wasn't the trigger, but it really seems to be the moment where the, the fuse went off. That's what we're talking about. A previous situation led to this reaction that was delayed. Dialogue is reactive and situational. What's the next rule? What's the next thing about dialogue? No matter what, whether we're writing aliens or fantasy races or robots, maybe not robots, but fantasy creatures, supernatural beings, all that stuff, the reader, whomever they might be, wherever they are, isn't one of them. Your reader is presumably human. 
So the reader will have an expectation that the dialogue they're reading from whom at whatever character is saying it, that the dialogue they're reading is understandable and relatable in some way. They get it. They get what the character is saying and they get why they're saying it. So it doesn't matter how erudite and special the character is to express their knowledge in a patronizing way. That, that's just window dressing. That's like saying John's wearing a sweater. Your characters have to sound human, meaning your character has to sound human and relatable to your reader. I am not... Where's my soundboard? Here. I am not... Talking about how every character has to use modern current slang. I am not talking about how every character has to use contractions if it's not period or functionally appropriate. It's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is even if the language is particularly dense and very, very like forced and artificial in the way that it's sort of a BBC production. The reader still has to be able to figure out who the hell said what and why. Because every reader wants context. They want to know why you're showing them whatever it is you're showing them at the time you're showing it to them. Every damn time. Dialogue is reactive and situational. It reveals, meaning it's a camera for, feelings and thoughts. When we partner dialogue with movement, we get what's called emoting. Emoting is basically the actions characters take in in combination with speaking to help deliver an emotional response to people. So if I'm angry... Yes, my voice is raised and I'm speaking in a raised way, but I'm also, because it's me, I'm probably gesturing with my hands and pacing around and I've got fists and I'm, I'm moving my body in a way to suggest anger and the dialogue plus my body movements convey to you, oh, John's angry. Emoting is a partner to dialogue and emoting is displayed via sentences that talk about a body moving while speaking or before they speak or just after they speak or in and around a dialogue beat. Yes, there can be emoting outside of dialogue beats, but we're also still talking about dialogue as a section here, if you understand what I'm saying. Emoting is just movement plus talking. It helps convey feeling. It's the body language question. Now, somebody asked me the other day, and it almost made it into the chat, how much research do I need to do? How much, how much of an expert do I need to become in body language? You don't. It, it helps a little, but you don't need to like fall down a rabbit hole and deeply research like chin boxes and, and you know, maxillofacial muscles. Convey it as best you can. Remember, you've got a, you're seeing the TV in your brain and the person you're talking to has their back to the screen and it's your job to play the game and put the movie in their brain. So it's okay if you don't know the name of the muscle that's currently tense. But it's important that you're able to convey that, oh, you know, they're making a face. And it's clear enough that a reader who doesn't know what you mean can read your sentence and go, oh, that's what you mean. That's dialogue. Following those steps will change the way you write dialogue. And your dialogue will always sound better. This is usually the point where somebody goes, yeah, but what happens if I write like too much dialogue and everybody's monologuing? So let me answer that question. Nine times out of 10, you're monologuing because you haven't made the decision as to what is situationally appropriate versus what is not situationally appropriate. Because if dialogue is reactive and situational, why on earth is everybody speaking in big, giant chunks? Because sometimes somebody's just going to go, yep, cool, all right, go fuck off, and move on with things. It is not necessary to always have everybody info dump all the time. It's great when we're writing, you know, 
early readers and middle grade books where the reader is still learning to grapple with written language. But if you're writing big, giant, epic-ass fantasy, you can probably get that your reader's done some reading before. And big, giant, droning paragraphs are basically sedatives. As a character goes on and on about every last little link in the chain mail and every little stupid petal and every stupid flower from here to the next continent over, dialogue has to sound like people. Do you, human being, right there, right now, who's writing this book, do you have people in your life who sound like that all the time? If you do, I'm very sorry for you. But by and large, you don't. And you've tried too hard to sandwich in some lore or sandwich in some world building or sandwich in some plot in your dialogue. And dialogue, because it's reactive and situational, is not where your plot goes. I'll say that again. Dialogue is not where your plot goes. What does that mean? Well, it means that two people who know what they're doing and are in the middle of doing it aren't talking about doing it. Let's suppose you've got two characters who are going to rob a bank. They can talk about the plan before they rob the bank, but while they're in the middle of robbing the bank, they're not going to turn to each other and go, hey, character B, we have to rob the bank. We have to rob the bank right now because they're in the middle of robbing the bank. Dialogue is reactive and situational. Explaining the plot to your reader via dialogue is going to suggest two significant problems. One, you think the reader's fucking stupid. And two, you don't have a firm handle on your plot because you got to keep rewriting it over and over and over again. I don't know if either of those conditions are conditions you want to have exist with your work, but that's what happens when you have your characters talking about plot. The characters are living in that world. They know what the hell they're doing. You just need to get that across to somebody who isn't there. That's dialogue. Let's jump over and do exposition. Just the broad stuff in exposition. Ready? What we're going to do in exposition is detail things. Put objects in space. Create spaces. Fill it with objects. Give that stuff some context. Give that stuff some adjectives. Create relationships in time and space and action and movement between things. It's how I tell you that an office is cluttered. It's how I tell you that the bathroom is messy. It's how I tell you that somebody's hungry. It's how I convey to you that the light is on. I'm just chaining together particular facts. And every time I make a new sentence, I want you to think about it as though the camera that is relaying the visual information to you is changing in some way, shape, or form. We're going to cover that more in like 10 minutes. But for now, this is where we plant that seed. Every sentence is a new camera looking at a new thing in a new way. Whether that new thing is a little old thing that you're recontextualizing or not, That's because it's the function of the sentence, remember. But we'll get there. But in exposition, you are just creating things into existence. If you want to get really like swirly twirly about it, you're literally calling it into existence and manifesting it. Good news, you're an ace manifester. I'm sure some, you know, like strange white lady on the internet would love to take $10,000 from you. It's totally a thing. So... Exposition creates material. It's sort of, it's binary. It exists or it doesn't exist. If you don't write it down, the reader's not going to think about it. So science fiction people, if you want to tell me that there's life on 11 other planets and you never mention them, the reader's not going to think to go, oh gosh, what about the 11 other planets? Because they're not going to even know the 11 other planets exist. Romance writers, hi. If you're not going to describe for me the, the sort of ruggedness that your chiseled abs, stubbled you know, protagonist has, if you're not going to detail those feelings, the reader's not going to automatically assume they're there. The reader's not stupid, 
but the can, reader can only work with what you provide them. So make with the providing. Exposition. Third thing. And then we'll stop and double check and check in with each other and make sure we're good. Third thing, narration. Now, narration is exposition through the lens of a point of view character or following a character. And this is where we lay another seed for how we make every sentence as a camera into a thing that works for us. Because the proximity of the camera to whatever it's showing, so camera showing, whether it's close or far, that closeness is called psychic distance. It is the distance of the virtual camera to the thing it's describing. And narration has a fixed distance. There is a fixed psychic distance because it's a narrator. First person has a closer or a shorter psychic distance than third person omniscient. Because remember, third person omniscient is the puppeteer. We're way up in space looking down at everything and we can zoom in and zoom out however we want, however much we want. In third person limited, we can still do that zooming, but it's going to be on a smaller scale. But the, the psychic distance is still fixed. You can zoom in and zoom out periodically, but eventually you have to default back to your regular setting. If you're in first person, you're in first person. It's just a matter of how close or how far you're going to be, but you're always in first person. If you're in third person omniscient, you're in third person omniscient. You know, zoom in, zoom out, move left, move right, whatever. That's what I'm talking about. Narration is great when you want to both create and manifest physical objects and describe things, but also detail how the reader should feel about them based on how the character feels about them. This is like looking at the world through sunglasses. Stuff's still there, but we're looking at it through a filter. That filter is, in this case, sunglasses, or metaphorically, it's how the character views the world. So for first person, whether we're writing a detective story, fiction, fantasy, women's fiction, whatever, that, what that, whatever. The minute you're in first person, there is what's called an automatic packaged bias. Automatic packaged bias, which is the assumption that what the reader, what the reader is reading, what the character is saying, has some level of opinion to it. How the character, first person narrator, describes things immediately gets the reader on board. Because the reader, the, sorry, the character is not objective on behalf of the reader. So if you're following a first person protagonist as they walk through their day job and they hate their day job and they describe it in unpleasant terms, the reader, if they like the protagonist, if they like the character, is going to side with them and also hate their day job. But objectively, if we were to look at the job itself, and maybe it's just data entry. Maybe it's just, you know, not all that big. Maybe they just sit in an office and collect a paycheck. Who knows? But objectively, there's a difference between how the job really is and how the character feels about it. But because narration carries a packaged bias, the reader adopts that bias. If they, assi if they side with the character. If they disagree with the character. Because, I don't know, maybe the character is slowly descending into madness. Or, or maybe the character is just an asshole that the reader shouldn't like because they're a bad person and we're waiting to see the bad person get what they deserve. Then there's going to be, you know, antagonism against the character by the reader. They're going to be disliked. They're going to be set off. And that's fine too, but that's still a decision you have to make. You don't want to get into a situation where sometimes you love this character and sometimes you hate him because that's going to convey to the reader that you, the writer, couldn't make up your mind. You, the writer, couldn't figure out how to say the thing you want to say, so you're splitting the difference, and whatever it is is whatever it is. I'm assuming second-person narration has roughly the same rules as first. Yes, it does. That's a good point. I didn't mention second-person. I should mention second-person more often. Yes, second person more or less has the same rules as first, only instead of it being I, it's one person removed. It's you're standing next to the first person. But yeah, it follows the same rules. It carries the same bias. 
third person may have a bias. It's a little bit more flexible because given the fixed distance of third person, the bias isn't so clear. This isn't just, you know, hi, I'm John and I hate mayonnaise and I describe mayonnaise, then I make you feel like mayonnaise is gross too because it is. But in third person, if I can just state that, you know, John hates mayonnaise, you, the reader, are still allowed to have your personal response because you were detached from me. You don't carry that bias. Second person, that's John. John hates mayonnaise. You still get some bias because we're closer to me than in third person, but still you get to retain some of your, you, the reader, your feeling about stuff. Make sense? One note before we toggle over, I want to I want to kind of slide this over a little bit. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with me fussing with the camera. Okay. Should I go full screen for this? Let me go full screen for this. Oh, no, did it not go full screen? Son of a bitch. Did I just lose everything? Hang on. Weird. Anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. I think my thing is all borked, but I'll, I'll deal with it later. Anyway, pay attention. This, this is important. If you are somebody who's alternating points of view or changing from one point of view guy to another, one chapter is going to be this person, another chapter is going to be that person, another chapter is going to be this third person, et cetera, et cetera. If you're doing that and you don't want to immediately get flagged as somebody who like sucks at it or is new and will therefore be likely rejected for it, and if you want to make it sound like you're really polished with it, remember that bias. And remember that each character that's leading the narration should have their own bias. That doesn't mean that characters need to be wildly divergent from each other. That everybody can hate mayonnaise. They should. Mayo's gross as fuck. But how they relay that to you can be, should be, and needs to be different. Every character has a bias. Every character has some set of tools and lenses through which they see the world that the reader is going to react to, respond to, give a shit about, not give a shit about, connect with, vibe with, want to vibe with, want to connect to, or reject. That's just building a relationship between character and reader, and that's probably going to be a subject of a different Monday stream. Because that, that whole topic goes off in places. All right, we are about halfway. The technical stuff is coming, but I want to make sure everybody's good so far. Any questions on person, uh, narration, exposition, dialogue, sentence function, etc.? Any questions so far, let me know. We can feel differently about Mayo and still work together. Totally. If you love Mayo, great. I do not. You can totally love Mayo and I will happily work with you. Not so much to change your mind on Mayo, although that may happen. But it's okay that we disagree on Mayo. I don't need you to agree with me in order to be a better writer. It's just that you're wrong about Mayo. It's okay. I bet you probably like a different sports team than I do. That's fine too. But, yeah, mayo's gross. But we can totally work together. It's no problem. You guys, See, everybody's like, you like, I, I don't, see, I love you guys. You know I love you guys. But I can never really tell if you're, like, just poking me to poke me. It's fine. I love you all the same. Yeah, but I just dislike mayo. I've always disliked mayo. It, it comes from his first person in narration and exposition wrapped in one. Kind of? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's easier to say yes, mostly. It's probably helpful to think of it that way. There are, there are like technical specific distinctions that you, the writer, are never going to have to really give a shit about. So it's easier to say yes, sort of. In first, second person, pure exposition doesn't happen. It's always narration and not a, ah, uh, yes, it, it, it happens sort of. Again, there's a really technical level of like, there's a whole other pile of terms and shit that you, you're ne- I don't want you to worry about as a writer because I want you to focus on what you're writing. But in that case, in first person or collapsed second person, narration is itself exposition. It is not specific exposition. It's just, 
arguably it's called narrative exposition. It's sort of like a fusion of the two. But yeah, it's pretty much the same kind of shit. There are things you can do to separate it, but you don't need to just, just fucking put a movie in the reader's head and the narration will take care of itself, okay? Everybody good though and everything else? Else we will march forward into the way more technical end of this. And there's a reason why I did this part second. And the reason primarily is you have to know the beginning half to get here. Because I want to tell you about one time I played the game with Sid. And this matters. So, in The Godfather, Sid loved The Godfather. It's a great movie. Sid loved The Godfather, though. He said you could find almost any good part of writing in The Godfather. So, there's this one scene. If you've never seen The Godfather, shame on you, but it's okay. There's this one scene where James Caan, Sonny, that's the name of his character, gets out of a car, walks down the street, and goes and beats the shit out of a guy, uh, out of another character who's been abusing his uh, Sonny's sister. It's a fairly famous scene because in the scene, um, there's a lot of space between James Caan swinging his fist and the guy taking the punch. Like the punch passes within like inches of him. And the guy sells it like he's right there. That's a famous goof kind of a thing. But the idea remains the same, that this scene really conveys action and emotion and tension. But we were playing this game, and I'm watching this scene, and I wrote down that Sonny, that's the name of the character, beats up, I believe it's Carlo. Uh, Sonny beats him up. And Sid stops everything and tells me, no, he doesn't. And I'm, I'm looking at the screen. James Conn is clearly fake kicking the shit out of this guy. He's literally kicking him at a few points. And, and Sid comes to me and goes, he's not beating him up. He's not, you know, progressively hitting him higher and higher up against gravity. He's not knocking him higher and higher into the air. He's not beating him up. You have to think about the phrases you say in order to communicate what it is you're trying to say. Because when you say beat up, what do you mean? Because the picture in my head for James Conn beats up this other guy is different than your definition of beat up. Yes, it refers to the same general class of violence against another person, assault, injury. But the specific actions... Is it two left fists? Is it an uppercut? Is it an elbow? Is it a headbutt? Does he kick him two times? Does he have a weapon? The specific actions you maybe want to call attention to. The more specific an action, a movement, a thing, the more specific you want to have the reader picture, you have to move that camera in. You've got to close psychic distance or collapse it. You've got to zoom in because if you want to see James Kahn's right fist make, you know, impact with this guy's solar plexus, then you got to describe that. Be very careful when you're writing things and you're not necessarily being careless, but you're being broad at a time when you're trying to convey an emotion or an idea. Hang on. Here's a thing I wish he told me then that I'm telling you now. This does not mean you need to detail everything as though I'm like two inches from the camera. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if I need to be this close to show you my fingers, then I need to be that close because I need you to see my individual fingers for some reason, for whatever it is I'm describing. It's okay sometimes to be that close. You can't always be that close. That's nauseating and overwhelming with the amount of information. But rather than just say, well, he, he beat him up. He ran real fast. What, what is the, the question becomes, what is the reader supposed to picture when you say that? Sometimes the reader doesn't need the specific details. 
He go, you know, your character went to sleep. They don't need the specifics of like, well, then he, he pulled the blanket up with his one side and he turned his shoulder three degrees and he tilted his head and his mouth opened this much. Like you don't need to get into like the obnoxious hyper fixation of it. And sometimes it's okay just to say he fucking went to bed. But other times you do need to detail those things because you have a reason for it. That reason should be to provide the reader context, to clue them into something, to give them information that they can then carry forward, either new information or to help expand on existing information. Remember the two functions of the sentence we talked about at the beginning. Every sentence is a camera. And now we're going to learn what that is. So your reader, I don't care what you're writing. I don't care how many drafts it is. I don't care if you're new at this or not. I don't care what it is. Your reader wants to feel like they're in the room with the character, that they're right there, wherever, wherever your character, your focus is, you know, your main character, your narrating character, your point of view character, any of those characters, your primary characters, whatever you want to call them, that your reader is right there next to them, right there next to them. So if your character is facing down the dragon, sword in hand, your reader is standing right there next to them. They want to feel like they're in that space. They want to feel what the character is feeling. That's not the same as knowing what the character knows. Do not mistake, do not mistake knowledge and feelings as interchangeable things, because they're not. But they want to feel that sense of fear or excitement or whatever the character is feeling, because the reader wants to be present in every scene. The reader wants to be the invisible tourist observing the action from as close as possible. And it's up to you, writer, to allow them to get that close or to control the distance the reader is positioned relative to the action. So come back to the Godfather scene for a moment. The way that scene is shot, the way that scene is framed, is that James Conn and the guy getting the, the shit kicked out of him are on a stoop, like in the middle distance of the frame, and the viewer is held way back. Like there's a lot of block between the fixed camera position looking down the street, actually it should be looking down the street on the, on the characters at action. The characters are real small in the frame. And there's a reason why. Because we're trying to detach the character or the reader, or the viewer, from Sonny's anger. Because we want to see the brutality of it. So we've zoomed out to show us the biggest picture. We collapse psychic distance when we want to provide detail and make each detail significant. This is why when they film like a boxing movie, the camera zooms way the hell in all the time because we want to feel the impact of the punches. We want to know they matter. This is why when we have detectives looking for clues, we zoom in because we want to piece together the mystery along with them. This is why in a sex scene, you know, we try to zoom in or, or show the camera fairly close because we're trying to give that sense of intimacy. The same is also true in porn, but in a, in a broader sense, we're trying to create the same sense of intimacy with things. You get to control that. You get to control where your reader is positioned. If you fail to do that, the reader, without any direction at all, if you start this thing off and never give the reader any sense of distance, they're going to be hanging out way the hell in the back. Like way back here, just kind of floating in space, waiting for something to happen. But if you start them off and you're following along and everything's close and you're manipulating things, but you forget periodically to move the camera, which we'll talk about in a second, the reader's just going to stay in the position they were in because you didn't tell them to move. You didn't give them something new to focus on. So all of a sudden, instead of like, you know, we're coming at, you know, we're talking this way and all of a sudden you want them to turn and talk this way. If you don't make it clear that they need to readjust because you didn't make a new sentence or a new paragraph or redirect focus within the sentence, the reader's going to stay here until they get a clearer idea. Every sentence is a camera and every sentence repositions or has the potential to reposition the reader in terms of distance, psychic distance 
from the action they're descri- they're seeing. Every sentence. And you can move the camera during sentences, before a sentence, or after a sentence. You can always move the camera. How do we move the camera? What are we talking about? Sentence construction, word choice, and punctuation to describe the thing you want them to see at some amount of detail in some amount of ways. Give them more detail. Use a lot of clauses. Throw some commas in there. Add some adjectives. You want to make something sound busy and active. Use some verbs. You want to craft something with quality. Use some adjectives and some other nouns and supportive structures. You get to move the camera. This is one of those things that seems really straightforward and it seems pretty easy. And on most cases, there is an easy way to do it. But this can get really fancy and this can get really elaborate. And it does work the other way where you can, instead of taking text and trying to relate it to a screen, you can, you can show it the other way around too. Because if you can see it in your head, you can figure out how to word it because every sentence should be a move of the camera. All right, so we start here. And then the minute we turn, sentence one, sentence two. And then the minute we zoom in, maybe that's sentence three or maybe that's part of sentence two. Remember, the two functions of a sentence are to introduce new information or expand on existing information. We can do that in the same sentence. We can do that in the same part of a sentence. We can start off introducing and then throw a comma in there and then the back half of a sentence can also expand on it. The cat slept. It's soft black fur lost amid the folds of the gray hoodie. I've introduced and I've expanded. Where would the camera be? Some distance away from the cat and the hoodie. Maybe I want to move the camera while we're talking. That's fine. Can do that. Absolutely can do that. Do I need to have verbs in the sentence to indicate a zoom? No. The camera isn't like a fixed object. It's not like a thing, right? It's not a camera. The camera is the reader's face. It's particularly the reader's eyes. You are controlling what the reader sees in their head on a sentence-by-sentence basis. So when you are describing X, Y, and Z, whatever the hell they are, you have grabbed... I'm going to take my glasses off. and You can stare at my face. You are grabbing the reader by the face and literally directing in any direction at any distance what it is you want them to look at and to what degree you want them to see it. You have, you have complete control over this, every sentence, every time. Now, I want to spend some time walking through different scene types to give you an example of this. So I've outlined a couple different beats. And we're going to go through each beat with a maybe a different example because some of them are harder to connect. But I want to do a beat with an example to show you how to move a camera each time. Everybody good so far? You're weathering the technical stuff really well. I'm all very proud of you. You're doing great. Thanks for being here. Thanks for checking it out. New people, hi. You're amazing. I do this every Monday. And on Wednesday, I answer questions. It's pretty fucking rad. Everybody cool? We good? Let me click the button and just double check to make sure we're good. There's the risky thing. I'm clicking the button. Oh, my God. So far, so good. Let's keep going. I'm doing really good. Let's go. Rock and roll. There's going to be air horns later. Just prepare yourself. So we're going to walk through some beats. I'm going to not, usually what I try and do when I, when, I, when I blogged about this, I tried to make all the beats one story, and that's fine. It gets a little obnoxious and cutesy. I'm going to try not to make it cutesy. So I'm going to give you different beats, and we're just going to move the camera all the way through. Let's start 
with probably the easiest kind of beat to illustrate moving a camera, an action beat. So let me think about a good action scene, like a real, I need a real obvious one. How about we do, how about we do two people arguing, but it's two people not arguing, they're arguing asynchronously, meaning maybe they're arguing back and forth in emails. Because if we were arguing in synchronized way, one person here and one person here going back and forth, well, maybe we should do it synchronously and then we'll do it asynchronously. We'll do them both. So let's suppose we have character A and character B and they're in an argument. It does not matter what they're in an argument about, but they're going to argue about something. And it doesn't matter if they're elves or rangers or chickens or robots or giant slug people from the sixth dimension. Eh, they're just people. They're just two beings having an argument. We need to figure out where to put the camera first. That's always going to be step number one. Where's the camera first? And that's going to come down to you, the writer, trying to say, okay, well, we're starting from this position at this distance, looking at this thing, this part of the fight, because, and then you're going to fill that reason in with a choice you've made. I want to start from like way zoomed back so that, we can show how like awkward it is that they're in this big crowded place and they're getting into a shouting match. Or I want to zoom way in and show just one person, the one who's going to instigate the fight because I want the reader to picture them starting the fight. Or I'm going to, you know, they're in a big empty space all by themselves. I want to show them as sort of isolated and weirdly alone. So I'm going to like, park the camera way the fuck over there away from both of them and try to describe them as just like two tiny people in a big ass space. Maybe they're having a weird argument in like a, like a football stadium or something or an airplane hangar. You need to make a deliberate decision where you park the camera at the beginning of every beat because the reader needs that context. The reader needs to know, okay, the writer is writing. Here's what I have to picture. Engage mental movie. If you don't do that, if you don't place the camera, if you don't start the movie rolling for the reader, do you know what happens? Everything goes black. The movie stops. And I'm not talking like it freezes mid-frame with something on the shot. I mean the camera goes out and the sound stops and everything sits in absolute blackness and silence. You don't want that. We don't want that like at all. Just an absence of that, please. So make sure you know where you start that camera. You can always move it, but you got to know where to start because you can't start moving it until you know where the starting position is. So we have what's called an establishing shot. That's the film term. It's also the same term in writing. The establishing shot. Where the hell are we? What's going on? What should I picture? What details do I need? for you to play the game and put the picture that you're seeing on your screen in my brain when my back is to the screen. What do I need to see? This is one of the points where someone maybe starts thinking, I'm saying that you need to do like the bare minimum, that you need to do the bare basics. Like, I'll just tell you the important shit and I, I won't give you the extra detail because I don't want to bore you or I don't want to bog you down or there's so many details or whatever horseshit rationalization they tell themselves. None of that's the case. None of that's true. You don't only want to give the reader the bare bones details because the reader doesn't only want bare bones details. The reader wants the movie. The reader wants the context. The reader wants you to describe the screen you're seeing that they can't see unless you tell them. So you're going to need to give them the important stuff that's plot critical or character critical or arc critical or scene critical. But you're also going to have to tell them like the less important stuff like, oh shit, there are clouds in the sky or it's raining today. Or, you know, there's a duck quacking over in the pond over there on the right. A combination of critical and, and less critical or non-critical detail help the whole scene, help the whole beat feel well formed. If you just keep giving the reader the bare minimum amount of stuff, the reader's going to think 
That's all your picture is. That's all your movie is. That it's just this real starved, bare bones thing. And they're not going to engage with it as deeply as you'd like. And when a reader doesn't engage as deeply as you like, do you know what happens? They either stop reading or they begrudgingly finish it. And you, you get a review, if you're lucky, that reflects, eh, it's not really as great as it is. You know, I'm not going to give this thing five stars. It was okay. Give it three. And then all of a sudden you've got a three-star review and you don't really know what to do because you did your best and what the fuck. So we give the reader a combination platter, a big-ass appetizer platter of important details plus less interesting details plus sort of interesting details all mixed together to establish where our camera starts for one sentence. And then we go to the next sentence. And what's the job of the next sentence? To add more detail or expand on existing detail. And we can move the sen- we can move the camera as much or as little as we want on a per sentence or per half of a sentence, if we really want to, basis. And that could be as simple as character A and B stood alone in the on the train station platform. Boom. We've put the camera way back. We've got A and B in a train station platform. Do we want to give more detail? Probably, but it's John's example. So maybe we give a couple extra sentences detailing the train station. The smell of urine hung like a wet blanket. The scattered remains of old newspapers dragged across the concrete. Distantly, there was the buzz of an electric motor. We haven't gone back to A and B, but we're painting the picture with the train station. Why? Because I want the reader to know about the train station. Maybe you want the reader to know about A and B, so you give some details about A or B or both. It's the example. It's okay. But notice that when we went from thing to thing, sentence to sentence, we always ask ourselves, do I need to move the camera in order to give the reader the best view of the thing I'm talking about? Because some of this detail I'm giving doesn't really have a visual. Like, how do you convey smell visually? You probably can't zoom in on something specific because smell is generally invisible. But if I want to convey an atmosphere, like, oh, it hung like a wet blanket, then I probably want to pull the camera back and show just, like, the dinginess of a place, right? So since I don't need to describe every inch of, like, mold and fungus and gross shit, I use a different sense to engage the brain to get the reader to pay attention. But every sentence, I stop and I ask, hey, do I need to move the camera? I need to give the reader the best view of the thing I'm describing. Does the camera stay where it is and I just keep going? Or do I need to move the camera? If I need to move the camera, meaning I need to grab the reader by the side of the head and steer their face, how do I reposition it? Do I move it up here? Do I move it down here? Do I come up this way? Do I tilt? Do I lean? You know, do I, do I zoom in? Do I zoom out? Where do I have to put their face to see what it is I want them to see? And then once I position their face there, once I move the camera, what do they see? So we have A and we have B and they're arguing. I probably want to show A instigating the fight because A instigates the fight in this example. So I got to figure out where to park the, their face, park the camera, so they can see A, look over there, and tell B that they're full of shit because that's, that's the fight. So I put the camera about here where this camera is, A turns to B, you're full of shit. Now, dialogue is what? Situational and reactive, which means it makes sense for the next thing to be, B, turning around and going, the fuck are you talking about? Situational, reactive. And then, because it's an action beat, we need to make the transition from talking to fighting. So the dialogue ramps up tension. Best way to ramp up tension in dialogue is shorten the amount of words. So it turns into, fuck you, no, fuck you. And then somebody's grabbing somebody else. And how do we show that? Well, we probably want to show the active movement, meaning we show the grabbing rather than the grabbed if we want to side with the guy starting the fight. If we want to demonstrate that the guy being punched, the receiver of the action, is the guy we should side with, then we talk about how he gets grabbed. 
He is the receiver of the action if that's the character we want the reader to more strongly connect with. How do we know which character we want to connect with? Pick one. Writing is the act of making decisions. Generally, you want to be consistent. If we came into this scene following A, we're going to follow A all the way through. <coughs> there are situations where you want to toggle back and forth, but they are not as frequent as you imagine. Any questions so far on that? The next thing we're going to do is an investigatory beat. Everybody good, though? We're doing okay? Not seeing a lot of panic in chat, so I'm assuming we're cool. Cool. Good, good, good. Investigation beat. What's an investigation beat? An investigation beat is a character discovering new information, particularly trying to answer questions. They're investigating. This is related to the next beat we're going to do called a discovery beat. But an investigation beat is where a character goes out of their way. If we were following A, how would you describe his punch? I don't know. How would I describe his punch? Well, where's the camera? How zoomed in do you want to be? Do we want to talk about fists? Do we want to talk about the hit, the force, the speed? What is it you want the reader to know or think or feel about the action you're describing? What do you want the reader to think or feel or know or some combination of all three about the thing you're describing? So if we're following A and A is instigating the fight and A throws the first punch, I'm probably going to write a real, because I'm me and I know my writing style and I know my voice, I'm going to write a sentence where A cold cocks B. And I'm not going to alternate between paragraph to paragraph and go A, B, A, B, A, B, because that's not how I write. But I'm going to turn around and go, A drove his fist into B's face repeatedly. Well, A drove his fist into B's face, period, repeatedly, period. Because I'm going to start using short sentences to indicate punch. Punch, 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 punch. Short sentence, short sentence, short sentence. Because that's how I tend to write action scenes when I'm left unsupervised and over-caffeinated. But if I didn't want to show the fist making the contact and I wanted to show the fluid motion of shoulder and bicep, well, then I guess that's what I'm describing. Where's the camera? Where does it have to be positioned? And on what does it have to be focused to deliver the picture you want? And is that picture delivering, developing, describing the thought, feeling, or reaction you want the reader to have? On to the, you're welcome. On to the investigation beat. So an investigation beat requires what's called an interrogative which is a fancy way of saying there's a question and the character is trying to get an answer. They are investigating. And sometimes that means literally the detective is looking for clues, but it also means a character just wants some information. Hey, do you know where the bus is? Where'd you get that sandwich from? Now, those are literal interrogatives because they show up in text. They are literally on the page. But an implied interrogative is some is A walking up to B and shoving them. And then B saying, what the hell's your problem? And then A launching into, hey, why didn't you tell me what's going on? And all of a sudden now we're investigating. Or if you want a single character beat, we have A burgling B's apartment looking for clues as to what happened to character C. And we would describe that, again, asking the same questions. Where does the camera need to be positioned? And on what does it need to be focused so that the reader gets the best view, one sentence at a time, at each activity, each thing you want the reader to focus on? So if we're burgling, we're probably going to show the lock being picked. So where are we going to put our camera? Probably pretty close to the lock. Or maybe we're not going to show, focus on the lock, but we're going to focus on the character as they're you know, really making a serious face trying to pick the thing. That's fine. But we're going to position the camera somewhere where the reader gets a sense of how important it is. 
If it's the lock, then the lock is the challenge. If it's the character making the face, it's them thinking, it's them challenging, it's them whatever. Sometimes you see this shorthanded in movies where they use a voiceover to conceal this. Voiceovers in films can often be like lazy shorthands, so they don't have to do more describing. Because if I can just have a character go, I tried to pick the lock. I don't have to describe the scene. I just had, you know, I just yelled it at your face. So we pick the lock and we walk into the apartment. Now, where's the camera? It's probably going to follow A into the apartment. Because we want that sense of like, oh, I wonder what's lurking behind that corner. And then as A attempts to investigate to try to solve their interrogative, we start showing different things. Where do we position the camera? Do we zoom in on the bills on the table? Do we, you know, make a jump scare out of looking underneath the bed? Do we, you know, park the camera way the hell up high on like a bookshelf and show the whole room? What is it you want the reader to picture and how do you want them to feel about it once you describe it? Every sentence is a camera. An investigation beat is all about a character trying to solve a question, get an answer. Sometimes that question is really simple, like what happened, you know, where's the bus? And sometimes it's more complex, like what happened to C? Or sometimes it's more, you know, emotional. Why did you, you know, why didn't you return my call? Or sometimes it's more, you know, broad, like what is the meaning of life? But there's always in an investigation beat a question being asked. Understanding that question allows you to figure out what you need to describe to answer that question, what you need to do, what you need the character to do, what you need the reader to see in their head. That's an investigation beat. Next is sort of the partner beat to that, a discovery beat. In a discovery beat, instead of having to go out and do the investigating, a discovery beat is pretty much an investigation beat where there's no investigation. Like, aha, I found my keys. I've discovered them. Or you have a conversation where, you know, oh, they don't have a sister. And the knowledge being revealed or the knowledge being discovered helps create context for something that happened prior to the beat we're in. A discovery beat helps contextualize new information pretty quickly. They don't have a sister. They died 10 years ago. That's not the name of the horse. Those are my keys. Yes, I'm framing them as statements because I'm talking to you, but in terms of sentences, it's a character making, uh, making a discovery, and as a sentence, it's about introducing new information, the first function of a sentence, to introduce new information. That doesn't mean it's just one sentence. We can spend plenty of sentences as a character suddenly has a reaction to it. They don't have a sister. Boom. Then we're in, we're in a paragraph inside the character's head for, you know, three, four, five, six, 22 million lines as they chew on this idea. Well, if they don't have a sister, what does that mean? Who was that woman? Who's the woman in the photo? What happened to C? You know, like we're building up to a... Which is fine and all well and good, but the function of a discovery beat is to sort of simplify the challenge of getting a reader, or getting a character some information because you need the story to keep moving forward. So, does an investigation beat become a discovery beat? It does. Investigation beats become discovery beats when there's a discovery. Likewise, discovery beats can create further investigation beats because once I've discovered that's not really the sister, I have to go do more work to figure out what happened. They're cyclical, but one becomes the other. Discovery becomes an investigation when I have to question, I have to go answer it, and an investigation when I find a thing becomes a discovery beat because, oh shit, a thing. The, the material that links those two beats together are either information that we will create context with or consequences. Consequences are basically where the character pays the price for finding something out. You see this really transparently in like action movies or detective stories 
where finding out that that's not his sister usually means somebody comes around and like kicks your ass. And the detective says something like, well, it tells me I'm on the right trail. Consequences are the, the owed payment for the discovery you made. Okay. So I've learned, I've investigated, I've discovered a thing. What's the price? What was the price for my effort? So if A burgles into B's apartment and attempts to find information, and they do find information, that maybe they secretly have, you know, they, they have a key to C's apartment. There needs to be a price. There needs to be a cost for this. Maybe we're building tension. Maybe we have a we make it appear that you know A could return a B could return at any time, so A needs to escape. Or maybe the cost is just the consequences is just well now we have more questions. It doesn't always have to be an action thing. It doesn't always have to be a suspense thing or a danger thing, but there does have to be a cost. There does have have to be a consequence to an action a character takes. This is really important. Because when you fail to have consequences, your characters don't have a chance to exhibit agency. Agency is the ability for a character to do shit and make decisions and take actions. When your character doesn't exhibit any agency, why the fuck are they in your story? And what the hell's happening? And your story slows to a crawl. Your characters need to demonstrate agency. Make choices. Do stuff for reasons. We've got two more beats. Everybody still good? Remember, every sentence, no matter what kind of beat we're talking about, after every sentence you write, ask yourself, hey, do I need to move this camera to give the reader the best view? Do I need to zoom in? Do I need to pull back and and detail more things? I'm talking about this in terms of do I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not meaning to make it sound forced because the answer isn't necessarily, it's critical that I move this camera. Sometimes you might just want to. Sometimes if we're following A and B, you know, arguing, 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 sometimes it's really helpful to do what's called a kick out. A kick out is where we go from A to B to A to B, back and forth and back and forth, and all of a sudden we're jumping to this big wide shot to show them that they're alone. Why? Why did we break this pattern we had set up? Well, one, because it's a pattern and we're breaking it. And two, we're further creating context. We kick out, meaning we change the focus for the reader for a sentence or two, and then get right back to things because we want the reader to have a moment where they can, (sighs) okay, I got you. All right, you've said six things. I have to park them in my brain. Okay, cool. I I can catch my breath for a second and then resume. You need to do this periodically, not like every paragraph. I don't mean like every fifth sentence must be a kick out, though there is a whole school of thought that says that, but they're really weird and it's really old fashioned. Don't sweat it, but just remember that sometimes it's useful to move that camera so that you can add extra information that is not limited to the immediate reactivity of characters. Sometimes when we're going back and forth and back and forth, it helps to remember, hey, you guys are having this argument in a location where an argument is completely out of place. Two dudes yelling at each other in the middle of a a quiet moment of reflection in a church helps contextualize the strangeness or awkwardness or meanness or aggressiveness of this argument. But if we have the same thing happen in a different context, two guys arguing drunkenly at a bar, kicking out to the bar allows us to show more detail about the bar more so than the argument because it's slightly more in line with things. It makes better sense that way. Don't dismiss kickouts. They're super useful. They are, however, to be used sparingly. You don't always need to use them every time. Use them periodically to help reset the reader's attention, to give them a moment, to give yourself a moment. And here we go with two more terms, and then we'll go back to beats. Something called tempo and something called initiative. 
Tempo is the movement of story, the pace. Is it slow? Is it fast? How is the story deployed? How quickly do we move from scene to scene, from beat to beat, from event to event, from chapter to chapter, from thing to thing, whatever it is? That's tempo. We say a story has fast pacing or slow pacing or fast tempo or slow tempo. Initiative is like tempo for characters. It's internal to the story. Characters have high initiative or low initiative, which is also basically saying they exhibit a lot of agency because they make choices and take actions and do shit versus having low initiative. They couldn't be fucking bothered. You want to make sure over the course of you moving this camera and constantly putting a movie in the reader's brain and showing us this and explaining this and coming out here and describing this and having this event happen and having that event happen, that you are managing your tempo and managing your initiative. And if this freaks you out because, oh my God, John, it's one more thing I got to keep in the air. It's, it's, it's one more plate I got to keep spinning. Relax. This one will pretty much take care of itself so long as you move from event to event in your story in some way, shape, or form somewhat consistently. I know this sounds like a lot. I know there's a lot going on. I know I've dropped a ton of terms on you. But these two terms, tempo and initiative, are important because they come up in other discussions. But we control them through sentence length, through paragraph length, through our word choice, through our sentence structure, whether or not we're commas and semicolons and all that shit, or ellipses or through the amount of time and space we spend per beat, per scene, or whatever. All of these things contribute in a way so that we have pretty smooth and consistent movement for the reader. When you've got a good amount of tempo and it moves well, and the characters have a decent amount of initiative, you end up with high readability. Readability is one of those bullshit buzzwords that publishing loves to use to demonstrate that you're a good writer, but they don't want to call it a good writer because apparently that sounds really childish. I don't think so, but that's publishing for you. Readability is, is the ease with which a reader engages with your text and how easily the movie goes into their brain. It's not overly dense. It's not slow. It doesn't take like 65 pages before somebody shows up with a point. It's not... Like, we're not detailing every blade of grass. We're also not doing, like, the barest bones of barest bones. It's a story we can get into and enjoy. It has good or high readability. On we go to our last two beats. And remember, if you've got questions, just fire away. Two more beats. And we've sort of already covered them, but I'm going to go through them at length. An emotional beat is where somebody has feelings. What feelings? I don't know. They just have them. Some amount of them. Maybe more than one. How much? Yes. They have some amount of some number of feelings. And they express those feelings. Maybe in terms of actions. You know, they're upset, so they cry. Maybe it's a lot of thinking the character gets all up in their head. Oh my God, that lady at work stared at me. Does she know? What if they don't know? What if they do know? Oh God, what, what if she thinks I'm a jerk? And all of a sudden we are spool. We're following this character spooling. Remember one of the ways we can position the camera. One of the ways the reader can be the invisible tourist is often inside a character's head. This stuff doesn't, it doesn't stop just because we have to go in a brain. That's just one more place to put a camera. This is particularly true in first person, where the line between what a character is thinking and what they're doing is really blurred because the psychic distance is really, really close. It's really zoomed in because we're part in and part out of a character's head. And their thinking is narration because they're narrating the story. It's also true in second person and less so true in third, but it's always there. You can park the camera literally anywhere in the story space you need to. 
whether that's a physical location or a physical height or a physical closeness or in somebody's head or with their feelings or in their memories, wherever, you can always move the camera. What we have to look at, what we have to deal with, what we have to do is understand that in an emotional beat, the context of the emotion is more or less the most important thing because the reader is going to ask you, hey, why is this character feeling this thing at this moment? And if they can point to specific things situationally, because emotional beats are situational, if they're feeling this thing and they can point to a reason, then they go, oh, that makes sense. Oh, they are upset about that person dying, so it makes sense that they're crying. But if you have an emotional expression or a series of character thoughts that don't easily connect to the situation that's maybe caused them, the reader is going to try and do whatever they can to resolve that. Maybe that means they, you know, try to make up their own reason. They try to figure it out on their own, like, well, why could they be doing that? And then they start theorizing for you. And sometimes that's what you want. But other times, it's the worst goddamn thing you can have them do because all of a sudden, they're less engaged in your work and they're off in their own la-la land trying to figure out what's going on. So when you have a character expressing emotion, make sure it makes sense. Hey, in this moment, the character is upset that this thing didn't happen. Okay. How do we convey that in sentence form? Well, we have a couple sentences about them physically moving, so that's part of it. But we also have a couple sentences talking about how they feel. We just outright say, John feels sad. Kevin feels hungry. Whatever. And that's fine. We can always move and reposition the camera, even within our own head. So John feels sad, and then we have a couple sentences where John feels sad, and then we have a sentence describing a particular memory. And... It's less about John and more about the memory, so that goes on for a few sentences. You can always move the camera. You can always change what it is the reader focuses on. Emotional beats help create a feeling of relationship between character and reader. They strengthen the reader-character relationship. If you want your reader to really, really like your character, like totally side with them, follow them for this book and future books, if there are any or whatever, then you want to make sure you really come across clearly in your emotional beats. Now, that doesn't mean your emotional beats are like really watered down where it's just, this character feels this, this character feels that. I'm not saying it's devoid of description or development. I'm just saying when your character is feeling something, you are able to express it in such a way that your reader can pick up and also feel some degree of it. So if you have a character that's feeling sad, you want the reader to at least A, be aware that they're feeling sad, and B, maybe, ideally, try to get them feeling a little sad themselves. Taken to maybe an extreme, whether that's a good extreme or not, this is where you get people in reviews and on social media talking about how, like, I read that and I cried, or this is really giving me life, or whatever other hoopla the kids are saying these days. That's because the emotional beat they're clued into resonates with them. Oh, this character feels this way. I feel very connected to the character, so what they feel, I feel more or less. And it's called fictional parasocial relationship because it's a fake person that they're having a not exactly real relationship with and they're sharing feelings. It's why when we watch certain movies, we tear up. We are not playing catch with our dead ghost dad and after the baseball game, but there we are crying because we wish our dad would play catch with us. We are not laughing at the Muppets because, oh my God, those are actual sentient three-foot-tall furry things. They're fucking puppets, but it's funny. Manage your emotional beats. Manage your emotional expression in those beats. Let the reader connect with them, 
and the depth of your writing, even if you don't add any extra detail, but the depth of your writing will feel more substantial. Emotional beats are fucking rad. Next one. Last beat we're going to talk about is dialogue. Now, we already sort of talked about this when we were covering action, but the dialogue beat refers to just the stuff in quotation marks. It's just the talking. And we already talked about how dialogue is reactive and situational, and we already talked about how dialogue, as it intensifies, generally tends to get shorter. There is a counterintuitive want for writers to make sure a reader gets it by getting long-winded. Monologuing is the extreme version of this. You don't necessarily want to do that. Resist that urge. I know it can be difficult. But monologuing breaks some level of suspense because one of the critical lessons to learn about your dialogue beats is this. While two characters are talking, and it doesn't matter what they're talking about, while two characters are talking, the world has not paused. It is not... Yes, resist Sorkinism. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. That's a really, really good way to put it. I mean, you should, there are other reasons why you should also resist Aaron Sorkin, which I will probably end up talking about at some point. But not everybody speaks in hyper-intelligent, perfectly formed monologues. Not everybody says things that sound like it's a third draft. So, nor is everything clever. Don't pull a Moffat either, where everything has to be clever and cute. Don't. Focus instead on the fact that the reader is the invisible person in the room, and the reader wants to feel like they are with or they are the character to some degree. And as you, the writer, you need to be the character when you're saying the line. All right, so I'm standing here. I'm going to argue with character B. These things just happened to me. I'm in the moment. What would I say? And then you write that down. And then A responds. They're going to do this and that. I'm B. What am I going to do? As the writer, you need to be able to inhabit every character. Now, in part, that's going to help your characters feel more well-defined. And in part, that's also going to help you figure out where to position the camera. Because if when you're thinking and pretending to be character B and you want to do something big and like grab the guy, well, then you need to figure out where to position the camera so the reader sees it. When characters talk, they're going to react more than anything else. Even if they're giving information, answering a question, winning a Jeopardy contest, who knows what. Even when they're describing something like, oh, well, that's a blue whale whatever it might be. It's always going to contain emotion and knowledge. Sometimes more one than the other, but it's always going to contain those two things. Even if the knowledge is just the knowledge that I have feelings, it's something. And it's always going to sound like people. And the camera needs to be positioned such that the reader is the receiver of that dialogue. This is called receiver-first dialogue structure. If you focus it on the teller, then it's teller-first dialogue structure. But nine times out of ten, you will do better and it will make more sense to frame it with the receiver because the reader will feel like they're in the room overhearing that stuff. Oh, he did say go to hell. Oh, snap. Like that. However, however, here's where you go from teller first instead of receiver. When the character, like your first person narrator, is delivering the badass line, then you want to go with the teller because you want to stand next to your telling character to watch the response to what they said. Always remember you want to position the camera to give the reader the best view of either what is happening or the response to what just happened. Every sentence is a camera every time. Going through those beats 
action, investigation, discovery, emotion, and dialogue. There are other kinds of beats, but those are the biggies. Those are the sort of the big classifications that you will run into in every kind of genre, in every kind of story. It's enough to get you started. Any questions before we wrap this thing up? Everybody good? No problem so far? I realize now as the stream is coming to an end, what was wrong with the other camera? I didn't click a button. I'm not going to click it now. It's totally fine. I'll fix it for Wednesday. But so far, so good. Problems, issues, comments, etc. The best view thing. I really vibe with that. Awesome. Love to hear that. I keep myself from being bored when I write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I frame everything in the most interesting way I can. Yes. In the last like two, three months, I have talked to a lot of people about what's called the volume of their description, meaning the quantity of words they write describing stuff. And almost to a person, they end up telling me something like, well, I get bored reading it, so I don't end up writing it. And I just want, if, if you're that person before I, I see your question, but before I answer that question, I want to tell you that if you're the person who answers a writing issue with, well, I get bored reading it, so I don't write it, you are making your writing infinitely harder. How many beats are there and where can I find out more about them? Uh, there is a great book by a guy named Robin D. Laws. The book's called Hamlet's Hit Points. There's a couple in that series now, but I know that first one. It's a great place to learn about beats. The other place you can learn about beats is in screenwriting books because they use beat theory more so than scene theory. Beat theory being the idea that stories are stitched together in beats, whereas fiction uses generally scene theory because beat plus beat equals scene. Is there another term that I should be Googling? No, story beats is a great term to Google to get you more information. You're going to end up getting a lot of screenwriting stuff. There's a lot of charts and diagrams and a thing called a beat sheet, which is basically like an outline template. Um, outside of screenwriting, nobody in fiction is going to go, give me your beat sheet, unless you're in school. But um, story beats are, there's going to be a lot of different uh, definitions for beats. Some of them are more right than others, but basically the shorthand, the easiest way to explain it is a beat is the smallest unit of storytelling information. Multiple beats combined together to form a scene. And then multiple scenes form a chapter and multiple chapters form an arc, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a beat is basically a unit of action. It's something happening. And I don't mean action like a car blows up. I mean action like something happens. There's a verb. Yeah, there's a lot of... It's it's a very screenwritery thing, but it is also one of those things that exists outside of screenwriting, but screenwriting sort of claims it as like, ha-ha, we invented it. They didn't. It's just that they're the ones who most frequently use it in terms of story currency. But you might have a scene. You're welcome. You might have a scene like, um, let me think of a scene. What did I watch today? You might have a scene like, uh, what the hell stupid movie was it? There was some movie about like a like a people people playing some dumbass game. I don't know what it was. Soccer. and It was a weird movie from like the 70s or something. It was British. And you'll have a beat where it's an action beat because they're playing some kind of soccer match. But it's also an emotional beat because apparently the characters, you know, give a shit about playing soccer and it's kind of a dialogue beat because they're talking to each other, but it's also somewhat a discovery beat because they're learning over the course of playing that, you know, they're going to win or whatever. A scene can be made of multiple beats. We will probably end up covering beats in a different Monday night stream because it gets real deep and it can get real deep and it can get real tangled. We might do that next Monday. Since I don't have a, a, a I, I know I need a topic for next Monday. So maybe we'll do beats next Monday. But all the same, 
beats are not limited to a sentence. You can have multiple sent you can have multiple sentences about one single beat. It's not like one beat equals one sentence. Even if they're long ass sentences, even if they're run on sentences, you can take multiple sentences to form a beat. However, because writing is full of contradictions, you can have a single sentence form a beat, depending on what that sentence is, depending on what the beat is. Like a discovery beat can be as simple as, you know, hey, look, a body. We found the dead guy. Or an emotional beat is, you know, hooray. There are loads of different ways to manipulate and bend it. What a great question that was. Other questions, issues, etc. cetera. Do beats correspond with the PEMS? I taught before. Yes. Uh, PEMS, if you don't know, is a way of structuring character arcs. So it's the physical, mental, emotional, and social dynamics that affect character creation. Yeah. Beats correspond with that because somebody's, let's say, P, their physical stuff, will relate to their skills and relate to the things that are possible in an action beat for them. The brain surgeon who has special training in brain surgery is going to be more physically geared towards things like brain surgery. They are not necessarily going to be automatically the best bestest at uh, building a house. They're different skills. Likewise, their mental state, the M in PEMS, P-E-M-S, their mental state might refer to the amount of thinking they do, which might speak to the amount of emotional beat constructions they get into. Or it might describe how they react to things in dialogue. Their emotional state directly correlates to their emotional beats. A character who's very much mopey is going to have a lot of downward mopey emotional beats. The S, their social interactions, well, that speaks to dialogue, because if I'm feeling social, I'm going to maybe talk more. It's, again, not a, not a perfect one-to-one, -one, but there are relationships between your character creation and the beats you use and the sentences you use as a camera to relate that information. Every sentence is a camera. Awesome. Great questions. Anything else, or shall we get out of here for the evening? Because it's been two hours. And I apologize for the occasional technical issues I, I, I don't know. I swear to you it's because I don't have a cable long enough to run from the back of this machine to the router. I just don't have the means. But, yeah, we do the best we can. We've, we've done so well. On the, and so far, Zoom hasn't crashed. So that means the podcast version of this should sound pretty darn okay. Other issues, comments, etc. Just as one note, mostly for me, um, I was with, I worked with Sid for about 10 years. I'm so glad you came, new person who I don't think I know. I'm so glad you got some notes. Wonderful. I was with Sid for, I'm so glad you got notes. This makes me so happy. I'm glad you guys take notes. I was with Sid for 10 years, the last 10 years of his life. And um, we played the game constantly so it was just fantastic and every, every sentence as a camera became the thing I most frequently stole from him because when I when he got sick and couldn't really go out and meet clients I would go out for him and we would spend a lot of time going through a scene line by line okay so you've got two people arguing where's the camera okay what do you want the reader to picture at this moment okay do we need to move the camera now that we've had this person say this Maybe we need to follow it here. Where do we put the camera for this? Okay, it's, it's you know, a romantic scene. Where's the camera? Is it stationary? Does it move? Where does it move? Where does it focus on? How close to the action is it? How zoomed out is it? Always question where you're putting your camera. You can always move it, so there's not really, like, a wrong choice. Yeah, some places are better than others. Some movements are better than others. But you can always reposition it. You can know that you have to reposition it when your sentence is unclear 
and you're not quite sure what the fuck the sentence is talking about, but you can also know to reposition it when you need to make sure the reader gets this idea across clearly. Oh, you want me to think about the car? Well, move closer to the car then. Every sentence is a camera. It changed my business. Not only did it get me out of copy editing, uh, it, it also made it possible for me to teach all the stuff that's related to it. Like psychic distance, like beat structure, like second acts, like MPOV. Everything's a camera. You've got to put a movie in the reader's head. When you get good at it, when you practice it, when you're able to see what you're writing and whether or not it is or isn't a camera that's effective, it will change the way you write. And as a side note, that's a deep pleasure for me. Uh, you will no longer engage in the stupid discussions on the internet about show versus tell because you don't need to anymore because your job isn't to argue about show and tell. Your, argue, your job is to put a movie in the reader's head. So sometimes you're going to show and sometimes you're going to tell and sometimes you're going to do both in the same sentence and sometimes you're going to do one in half a sentence and the other in the other half of the sentence. Every sentence is a camera. Any other questions, issues, comments, whatever? Else we will depart. All right. I think we're good. So let's get us out of here. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you for your great comments. I want to thank you for your subs. I want to thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful for you. I hope this at the very least got you thinking. I know some of you took notes and that's fucking amazing. Good for you. I hope it helps. Thanks so much. It, it really, if you do have questions, I do want to say, if you do have questions, uh, you can always come back right here on Wednesday night for the writer's chat or you can find me online. I'm on Twitter at twitter.com slash awesome underscore John. Uh, if you want more stuff like this, you can jump on the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash John helps you create, where you will get access to the Discord, wherein you can ask me questions all goddamn day and get whatever help you need. Uh, I'm here every Monday and Wednesday and sometimes other days, but mostly Mondays and Wednesdays to answer whatever questions you have and help you succeed however possible. And, and this one was a big one for me. This one means a lot. So thanks for being here. Uh, I will be right here. That's the Patreon link. John helps you create, by the way. I will be right here. The next time we will talk is Wednesday. So that's two days from now on the 26th. I'll be right here at 7 p.m. Eastern for the writer's chat. Uh, there are some fantastic questions would you like a teaser let's get you a teaser so let's come over here uh yeah that's question here's question 12 where you're gonna learn how to write sales copy on wednesday evening should be pretty great so until then do your best Keep going. Know that I believe in you. Know that I care about you. Thank you so much for being here. If you like this stuff, if you want more stuff like this, or you want to suggest things, uh, go jump on the Patreon. And all will be explained and made available to you for as little as $2 a month because it literally helps, you know, like feed me and pay the mortgage and buy my meds and feed the cats. So good times for all. Thanks for being here. I'll talk to you guys very soon. This is going to go up on the podcast feed in like 10 minutes and probably on YouTube. Let's see. Today is Monday. It'll go up on YouTube tomorrow. So Tuesday at some point. I don't know when. YouTube is a fickle beast. But until then, until next time, thanks for being here. I love you. You saved my life yet again. I don't know what I'd do without you. And I'll talk to you guys very soon very soon. Have some air horns. See ya!